breaking right now from Queen City News. And we are following that breaking news out of Washington, D.C. tonight as crews are searching for the in the Potomac River for victims of a plane crash. I want to take just a minute to talk to you about the terrible air collision that occurred at Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport. To pilots, this is known as KDCA. I know earlier you heard from my colleague, Joe LaRusso, who heads up our aviation division at Ramos Law on this topic and crash. Before I start, please know that our hearts and prayers go out to the families of all who've lost loved ones in this event. The loss of lives as a result of this mid-air collision is absolutely heartbreaking. There aren't words during a time like this that can offer any comfort. Just please know that our thoughts and prayers are with each and every person affected. As a pilot myself and for our entire aviation division, these losses have been touching and frankly somewhat emotional. So I personally fly a complex aircraft in and out of a lot of major busy airports across the United States. In my aircraft, my approach speeds, that's those speeds that you fly towards the, the landing with, towards the runway with, are about this, as fast as this jet that was involved in this crash, just a little bit slower. I've also flown a helicopter in training lessons and the speed differences between an airplane and a helicopter are dramatically different. This helicopter was probably doing half the speed of the jet, if that. Now, why do I mention speed right off of the bat? It's because no doubt this played a factor in why the jet was unable to avoid the helicopter. Here, the jet was likely coming in on its approach speeds to land at around 155 miles per hour. That's about 135 knots and would be about what I would expect out of this jet. From looking at the helicopter flight path, it's difficult, to sit, difficult for me to say exactly what speed the helicopter was going at. But again, it wasn't that fast. As this jet was coming in, it was on an approach. And an approach is just a fancy way of saying it had a defined path in the sky kind of like a highway in the sky. And this led the jet down to the runway where it was supposed to land safely with its passengers. To understand what an approach is and what flying an approach is like, I want you to imagine this. Imagine looking down a long hallway, a really long hallway, and at the end there's a room that you see. The room at the end is the airport, and the hallway leading down to it is the approach. Now. In this analogy, imagine that you're running down this hallway as fast as you can, running, running, running. There's not supposed to be anybody else in the hallway. You're running to the room. And then suddenly someone steps out of an office door along the hallway and directly in front of you. There's just no way with that speed differential between you and them that you'd be able to avoid them. You would collide. And that's exactly what happened here. On the approach, to runway 33 at Ronald Reagan National Airport, it appears that the initial approach fix, that's that place where you first enter the hallway, it's the starting point. That's like 10 and a half miles out from the airport. And you'll see that on the approach plate here. It's, it's quite a ways out there, and this airplane had quite a path to fly to get there. Now from what I've seen, this aircraft, the jet, appears to be on the route and properly. And you'll notice right before where it makes the turn to head in for the final uh, approach, that's where it's really coming into land. Right where it makes the turn, you'll see the river on the approach plate that I've given you for this airport. And that's where this collision occurred, was right over this river. This, the collision point appears to be just past this turning point in the highway in the sky in the approach called IDTEK, I-D-T-E-K. The airplane appears to have hit that point, turned to come into land. And indeed, if this is the correct approach that I'm reading it to be, that this jet was flying, it had just turned prior to the helicopter being directly in front of it and then the collision occurring. This may be one explanation as to why the pilots of both aircraft may not have seen each other. With regard to looking for other aircraft, as a pilot I will tell you, it's not as easy as you would think. I can't tell you how many times I've flown right by another aircraft and never even knew it. On almost every flight, I have air traffic control telling me through my headset that there's another airplane in its position. And I can see it on my screens, actually. I have screens in my airplane that identify these aircraft. I can see it on the screen, air traffic control is telling me, but I never see it visually. They're very difficult to see. This, this is likely because you're going so fast. Also, aircraft mix into the background very easily. 
And with two aircraft going fast and mixing in the background, it's tough to see each other. Here, this was at night, the jet and the helicopter both had their lights on. And I know the gut reaction, particularly when we see it on the news, is to say, oh, you can see it easily. But I can tell you as a pilot looking down on a city where there are lights flashing everywhere and street lights and roads, it can be a real struggle to even find the airport, much less another aircraft. So in addition to pilots visually looking for other aircraft, there's several other safety measures that help prevent situations like this. First of all, aircraft flying around a city like this must have ADS-B. ADS-B, you're gonna hear about it all over the news and in all these reports. It stands for Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, ADS-B. It automatically broadcasts out your position to the air traffic controllers. It tells you, it tells them, I'm sorry, what your position is, what your altitude is, your velocity, and who you are. A little identifier goes along with you. That's ADS-B, and most all aircraft have it, and certainly both of these did. In addition to ADS-B, many aircraft also have what is called TCAS. Now, TCAS stands for Traffic Alert and Collision Avoidance System. That's Traffic Alert and Collision Avoidance System, TCAS. These aircraft probably had this as well. This allows aircraft to detect signals from each other. And that appears, uh, at least on the screens in my airplane, as small diamonds on your cockpit pit screens. It shows these small diamonds where you're at and where they're at. And the purpose is to help the pilot identify where other aircraft are that might be near you. We would refer to that as pilots as situational awareness, being aware of what's around you. Now, we don't know for sure if either of these aircraft had TCAS, but as I said, it's very likely they did. So the question might be running through your mind now, and again, it's why I wanted to, to shoot an informational piece, is if we have ADS-B, the flashing beacon on all the screens, if we have TCAS, the traffic avoidance, uh, collision avoidance system, if we have air traffic controllers, if we have pilots looking out, why did this crash occur? Let me tell you, as a pilot, when you're this close to an airport and you're about to land, there are so many airplanes taking off, landing, taxiing around the airport, and in the airspace in general, that TCAS, your TCAS screen alone looks like a bunch of diamonds everywhere. It's kind of like a beehive. Now, it's helpful, but when airplanes are everywhere, it becomes dif difficult. Also, these airplanes are changing positions very quickly. So as a result, there's airplanes moving and diamonds moving and things everywhere and you can't rely on it solely as your way to avoid other aircraft. Again, it definitely helps, but you can't rely on TCAS alone. So, you know, the approach pathways are meant to help because people are supposed to be out of them. ADS-B signals are supposed to help because they're supposed to tell the traffic, air traffic control where we're at, our altitude and our speed. And again, um, the TCAS, as I've already mentioned, the most important part of all of this is the local air traffic controllers guiding us. Air traffic controllers, they tell us when it's time to start in. They tell us what altitude to be at, what speed to be at, and oftentimes how far ahead or behind we are of another airplane so that we can keep our distance. They truly are your eyes from the ground in the sky really bringing you in. They're incredible people. Let me tell you, air traffic controllers are the best in the aviation business. They save lives every day, and that's not an overstatement. It's unusual for pilots to be able to function well without their air traffic controllers. Pilots get confused. We hear an instruction improperly, or we just make an improper move or a poor decision. And who's there to bail us out? The air traffic controllers. And they do it every day, all the time. Air traffic controllers truly are the masters of multitasking. They're communicating with multiple people at the same time, giving directions, giving warnings, and guiding airplanes one after another safely to the ground. So in this particular collision, there's a transcript of the air traffic controller, and he's doing just exactly that. He was directing the helicopter to go behind the jet, and then later, just prior to the collision, you hear him say to the helicopter, he's confirming, hey, you see the jet. American 472 by that number individual. American 472 star Unfortunately, that's when the transcript ends. That, despite his effort, was the point where the mid-air collision occurred. So the message here to you is, is this. Should, should you feel safe the next time you get on an airplane to fly somewhere? The answer is absolutely yes. 
We have an incredible air traffic control system that delivers millions and millions of passengers safely all around the country and the world daily. There are multiple systems and backup systems to prevent tragedies just like this from happening. That's why we don't hear about these all the time, despite the great number of flights that are occurring. In fact, I believe the last major commercial air disaster in the United States goes all the way back to 2009 or so. So it's been quite some time. In this particular crash, there will be an extensive investigation that takes place. And it'll be determined what part of the system here failed. The process will take months to complete, but for an air collision, even of this severity, it will be determined and we will have answers. In the meantime, as I started, our prayers and thoughts go out to all of you who've had your lives changed as a result of this event. We wish you the very best. May God bless you.